All right, let's talk about solutions and molarity. Two really important ideas in chemistry. We'll define what a solution is, and then we'll talk about molarity, which is the most common way of measuring the concentration of solutions. So I'm going to format these notes in a way that allows us to kind of give some examples and make some columns here. If you start by writing the word solution, we're going to put a definition of solution off to the left, but I'm also going to reserve some space below here in the margin to uh, add some things later. I'm going to define a solution as a homogeneous mixture made from a solvent and a solute. And actually, I'm going to write solute and solvent in a way that allows me to put two columns beneath those words. Made from solute first and solvent second. And now I'm going to define these words, and I'm going to give some examples, again, making sort of a compare and contrast or a distinction in these two columns between each. The words solvent and solvent, I'm not solute and solvent, I'm now going to elaborate on a little bit. We can think of a solute as the substance in smaller quantity and the solvent as the substance in greater quantity in general. So I'll start by writing the substance in smaller quantity over here. And usually the substance in smaller quantity we could think of as being the thing which is dissolved. So I'll write being dissolved. And the other, excuse me, the other substance is doing the dissolving. So this should say being dissolved. There we go. And over here, we're going to write the substance in greater quantity. And I'm going to write doing the dissolving, um, although that's kind of a strange phrase. How do you do dissolving? Well, it turns out that dissolving is going to occur because of intermolecular forces of attraction. Most commonly, it will be something like an ion-dipole interaction between the solute and the solvent, or a dipole-dipole interaction, or a dipole-induced dipole. -induced dipole. Let's give some examples. The most common example we can give for a solution is saline solution or salt water. So let's start with that. And in that case, the solute will be the salt and the solvent will be the water. Over here, I'm going to make this column B for some examples. And I'll use saline solution as the first example. And of course, you may need to buy saline solution for your contact lenses. And it's used in other ways as well. And it has a really specific concentration. But most importantly, we want to understand that the salt is the solute. And of course, salt we usually think of as in the solid state. And water is the solvent. And that is in the liquid state at room temperature. So that's a solution made of a solid dissolved in a liquid. What are some other examples of solutions? A little less common would be, for instance, seltzer. A less commonly a given example. So can you think what the solute and solvent are in this case? Seltzer is an example of a gas being dissolved in a liquid, and seltzer is carbon dioxide in water. Another example of a solution is fog. Fog is a liquid, water, dissolved in a gas, air. Smoke is an example of a solution, and that's an example of a solid dissolved in a gas. If you look carefully at smoke, you'll see it's just little particles of carbon or soot. Might be an easier way to describe it. Dissolved in air. 
And if you look at fog, you'll notice it's actually just little particles of water dissolved in the air. And if you look at it through your headlights. Now, I'll give one example that should be familiar if you've studied different bond types. Um, metallic bonds only form when metals are bonded to metals. And when that happens, you are talking about an alloy like brass or bronze or steel. And this is an example of a solid dissolved in a solid. And these can be in any ratio um, of solute to solvent. Brass, we would typically consider copper to be the solute and zinc to be the solvent. And really, alloys are an example of a solution, kind of a strange solution because it's solid in a solid. Um, and the most common example where you're going to encounter, of course, is when you think of a solid being dissolved in water. But these are all examples of solutions. The next thing we're going to tackle is just some basic vocabulary about solutions. And some of these vocabulary terms are going to be familiar. I'm going to start on a new page and just title this vocabulary. And the first bit of vocabulary I want to make sure we understand are these words soluble and insoluble. And this might be pretty intuitive, um, but I want to emphasize that this refers to the degree to which um, something can dissolve or the degree of ability to dissolve. And in water is implied. So we should talk about that a little bit. If something is soluble, then it's highly soluble in water. And that's generally what people mean. Although phenethylene, um, that acid base indicator we've worked with before, is insoluble in water, but highly soluble in alcohol. So we have to specify if we're talking about a solubility in alcohol. If you just say soluble or insoluble, you're implying that water is the solvent. And of course, everything has a degree of solubility. You cannot put a wheelbarrow full of table salt into a teacup of water and expect it to dissolve. But salt is soluble, right? Table salt is soluble. So there's a limit to its solubility. And while chalk is insoluble, it is true that if you put a pinch of chalk into a bathtub of water, a little bit of that chalk does in fact dissolve. So there's a limit and a degree to each of these. But for now, um, we're going to talk about these as sort of a black and white either or condition for a solute. Either it's soluble or it's not. Um, but be aware of the fact that there is limits to solubility. Um, and nothing is infinitely soluble or infinitely insoluble. Let's define uh, something we've talked about before, which is an aqueous solution. That is anything where water is the solvent. And we use that adjective, excuse me, that uh, abbreviation AQ in this case as a state symbol. That just means water is the solvent. So if I were talking about dissolving phenethylene in alcohol, it's not an aqueous solution. Um, and I'd need to specify that I'm using a different solvent. Let's talk about another important pair of words, concentrated versus dilute. Again, these are, you know, not new vocabulary words, probably, but we want to understand how chemists are going to think about this. This pair of words describes a solute to solvent ratio. Where high would mean concentrated and low would mean dilute. Last bit of vocabulary we're going to include here is the word stock solution. And a stock solution 
is simply a routinely used concentrated solution. And you've probably heard me referring to the stock area in the classroom. So we'll just define this as a routinely used concentrated solution. And we're often in lab activities going to need to take our stock solution and make a dilution of it, or take a small amount of stock solution and add a lot of water. So that's the vocabulary. We're going to include one other concept in these notes, and that's probably the most important of these. Our notes were about solutions and molarity. And molarity is how we're going to measure concentration of solutions. So let's start with a new page, or if you have more than half your page left over, you could probably get this all to fit. Um, we're going to now talk about measuring concentration. And there's lots of ways that the concentration of solutions might be measured. There are lots of common units. Let's talk about two. One of them is units in which the mass to mass ratio is considered. So for instance, mass of solute to mass of solvent. And these will include things like percent by mass, parts per million, parts per billion, parts per thousand, etc. And while you see these in a lot of commercial products, you know, saline solution, and hydrogen peroxide is often going to be as a percent. And in environmental science applications, you're often going to use parts per million, parts per billion. Um, but in chemistry, we use a different way of quantifying concentration. Oops, don't write that down. Excuse me. The units we're going to use involve moles of solute per liter of solution. And notice that's different because that's not mass to mass, that's moles to volume. And this is another difference. Here we're talking about solvent and here we're talking about solution. And that's a subtle difference. Those two quantities won't always be the same. This is called molarity. Molarity is moles of solute per liter of solution. And this is the only way that we're going to be talking about concentration in this class. Very occasionally, we might need to deal with percent um, if we're analyzing a commercial product, but typically we're going to be using molarity. So let's define this really important quantity. The symbol for molarity is an uppercase letter M, and it's going to be defined as moles of solute. That's given the symbol N divided by liters of solution, which is given the symbol V. And it's very important to note that this is in liters. So I'm going to write this once again as M equals N over V. And then I'm going to rearrange the equation to one of its most useful forms, which is N equals MV. The number of moles in a solution can be given as its molarity times its volume. But in both of these cases, note that your volume must be in liters. And N must be in moles, not grams. Your volume can't be in milliliters, it has to be in liters. And this amount of solute has to be in moles. So we're going to do some practice with, with these uh, formulas here, but this is the definition of molarity, and this is how you can calculate the number of moles in a solution if you know its molarity and its volume.